might, might have been aware of uh, INET, the Irish Nepalese Education Trust, um, who have been uh, focused on work out in uh, Soda Kumbu district. Um, so I've kind of uh, had some research interest in Nepal. I've been out there a couple of times uh, focusing on um, medicinal plants and, and forests and uh, recently kind of climate change impacts on those kind of things. So I've uh, came in touch with INET as we were working in, in a similar area and um, I've come on board and now we're sort of shifting um, some of the emphasis onto environmental issues. So although education will remain a really integral aspect of INET, uh, we're looking more now towards environmental issues and in particular um, uh, initiative that we're uh, organizing now and starting to, to roll out is the Mountain Forest and Livelihoods Initiative and that is uh, it will be a program of INET. Um, so uh, it's mostly mostly pictures but a few uh, a few bit of text. So as I was saying I, I uh, came into contact and interest in Nepal uh, through research activities and uh, with Trinity College, I'm um, finishing my, my doctoral studies there. So I've worked with uh, the Flora Nepal. So uh, Nepal hasn't had uh, a systematic list of species, plant species. Uh, so that, that project is ongoing. It's been coordinated by Edinburgh for Royal Botanic Gardens over there. And I've, uh, I've worked uh, as part of that to, um, to uh, describe uh, and cover the taxonomic description of some species, in particular Himalayan poppies. Um, so at Trinity we've um, coordinated the account of some of the chapters and uh, discovered new um, records, new plants growing in Nepal that nobody knew were in Nepal before and uh, we've, we've described some new species uh, of, uh, of plants completely endemic to Nepal as well. So uh, the Mountain Forest and Livelihoods Initiative were um, focusing on a type of forest that grows from eastern Nepal e uh, eastwards to, um, towards uh, Bhutan and uh, into Yunnan in uh, Yunnan province of China. So that's called Eastern Himalayan Broadleaf Forest. And uh, the forest is quite, um, quite special for a number of reasons. It's, it's one of the most uh, species rich uh, forests in the world, even if you're comparing it to the the likes of tropical forests in Brazil, you're, you're finding uh, similar uh, levels of species richness there. And of course, uh, iconic things like uh, red panda are, are living there, and in particular birds as well. Uh, just down at the bottom there, it's some basic stats. Uh, Nepal has it only has less than one percent of the landmass in the world, but yet it has one percent of the plants. And amazingly. Almost nine percent of all bird species in the world are found in Nepal, and these uh, uh, broadleaf forests are really special habitats for those. So, looking to uh, forests in particular in the country, um, there's been uh, quite quite a problem of deforestation over the last decades. Um, I think something like a quarter of all forests have been deforested in the country, um, partly due to population pressures. And although that rate is slowing, we're, we're seeing the rate of deforestation slowing, it's still very, very much significant. Uh, so this is out in Solakungu district, uh, not too far from Everest, but more towards the south of, of the district. So it doesn't see a great deal of the tourist activities that go on towards the, the north part of the district. Uh, so this, uh, in, the, in the green, is temperate mountain oak forest. So oak is a, is a particular focus of, of the initiative as it's really used for a lot of reasons. Um, it's evergreen, so in the winter time, uh, people get to, to, have, to harvest the leaves and they feed it to their livestock. It's used as timber. And for that reason, it's been heavily degraded and exploited uh, in the mountains. And looking at this map, this is a habitat map that I, I assembled. Um, it looks like there's a lot of forest there, but uh, unfortunately when you do land on the ground there in, in salary towards the uh, right of the image, you can see you land there in, in the plain, 
when you step out, you expect to step into old forest, but it, it's certainly not the case on the ground. And uh, we are talking to some of the, uh, the local forest groups out there, and they said people like the WWF, the, the conservation charity, they've fallen into the same trap. They've, they've come out here in a helicopter, got out and said, where, where are these forests? You know, we're expecting to see old forests, and they're simply not, not there anymore. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like, uh, where originally this would be all forested area. We're seeing just these oak forests, just kind of remnant patches that for some reason hasn't been completely <coughs> destroyed. So it's kind of a forest that's really in much need of, of protection. Um, so Sorry, Mr. Yeah. Paul, can I just interrupt there? Yeah. Um, the, the people up in the... So the Kumbo have actually been banned from cutting local trees now. Okay. They just can't cut them for housing, okay. anything. And that's only happened in the last year. Right, right. Okay. I so mean, they're having to go much further afield. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, banning is not really solving much. No. I mean, there's livelihoods that are based mm. on these. Um, so there's what are called community forest user groups uh, up there, and they collectively manage uh, communal forest areas. This is an example. Um, so they do have kind of a vested interest in protecting a uh, communal forest. And uh, in the 1970s, Nepal was actually one of the leading countries in the world in designating community forests. Um, the government realized its limitations. It can't protect forests. So what it did was handed over forests and lands to community groups. And that was way ahead of its time. It was very innovative. and. Uh, on the ground today, you see a lot of community forest groups that are trying their best to manage forests um, sustainably, but it's very problematic. Um, so some of our aims, um, we're going to work closely with these community forest user groups. Um, so they're pre-existing, which is an important thing. It's not up to us to come in here and designate who does what, these groups are already existing, they have kind of management plans for the locality, so we're working with them, uh, listening to what their needs are. Uh, so uh, this, these pictures were taken at the, the district forest office in Solokumbu, so you, you can kind of see that they're um, sort of developing uh, nurseries and forests. Unfortunately, they have tended towards more pine species, which are which are quick growing. Um, obviously, you want uh, results showing fast, but uh, our focus on the on the oak forest it's very slow growing, so it's not very profitable immediately. But it's it's the right thing to do. We're wanting to restore what are natural habitats, and as part of that, uh, bring that into to people's livelihoods. So one of our aims is to. To, to develop nurseries for raising oak. It's going to take a long time. It won't have the quick results that uh, planting pine species will have. And uh, one of the issues, because it's so slow growing, um, is how to release some of the value from these forests. Not, not in 30 years time. Uh, we want to release some of the value more immediately. And the idea is that we're going to be, for the forests that are planted, generating carbon credits um, so these are these are things that are marketed internationally uh, companies or any businesses that are um, releasing lots of CO2 uh, they buy carbon credits to neutralize if you see companies they say they're carbon neutral for instance they will buy carbon credits so that's what we want to do we want to plant these forests uh, estimate the credits that are produced sell the credits and that money is, is brought back to, to the people um, that are responsible, the community forest user groups. And the advantage to that is um, we can bring this money already soon, not after 30 years. This can already happen very quickly within uh, two, three years. So that really kind of, it brings results to them quicker, which is very important, I think, for, for gaining the, the trust and uh, um, showing that the, the project has some more immediate results. Um, so, as I've been talking a little bit, uh, developing the capacity of what are pre-existing indigenous uh, groups is something that we, we think is really important. So, uh, we're collaborating with the, the District Forest Office uh, in Solokumbu, 
and they have um, what they call uh, an adaptation plan for climate change, which is really a big issue in, in mountain regions as the climate becomes a lot more unpredictable. We're wanting to diversify livelihoods away from, say, traditional agricultural production, which isn't very suited to mountain regions. Um, we're going to work very closely with uh, the Federation of Community Forest User Groups in Nepal. So this, as I was saying, um, this group, uh, FECO Fund, they have about a million uh, members. So that's uh, nearly one in every 27 Nepalese people are, are a member of this group. It's a, a grassroots organization. And on the ground, the local structure is the Community Forest User Group. And, uh, Kind of maintaining the, the legacy of INET and its work in the region, we're going to be tying into to some educational activities, um, particularly with Satarangi Trust, who uh, Dan Arrives has worked uh, to, to form this trust, and that's active in schools as part of kind of environmental education. So really, we want to tie into that and continue some kind of educational activities that INET has uh, worked uh, to build up in, in the region. Uh, with that, I'd just like to, to finish, hopefully, in, in graphical format, this is, this is our aim, um, to, to transform land that is degraded and deforested, um, and uh, restore that native forest, and at the same time, through mechanisms that are supporting sustainable livelihoods. So, thank you very much.